Hi everyone. Hi. Hi. <laughs> How are you guys this week? Okay. All right. Yeah. How did you find reading chapter three? It's oh. a corker, isn't it? There's lots of emotions, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Barbara, uh, Tim, if we could just have the mic to Barb. We're not going to start rolling on chapter three yet because I have to. We've got unfinished business from last week, so. But what we have to say. He's very poetic in this chapter, yeah. isn't he? Very. Actually, although it's difficult, it's very beautiful. Definitely. And some of the phrases and different things he oh, says. Well, I've highlighted every one of them. That's what I'm like. I think, okay, what are the key parts to talk about? <laughs> yep, everything's <laughs> underlined. <laughs> Which is sort of why I wanted to backtrack to chapter two. Because there was stuff last week that, um, well, it's more with different themes and different reflections that came from people after the group that I think would be great to talk about. AJ and I also had a chat after the group and he helped me recognise a few of the things that I had skipped over in the group and that's very valuable because I'm up here sort of, I was just saying to Lulu and Barbara before we started that last week the chapter was so emotional for me, it's all about service and, and I just cried reading it, cried trying to prepare, cried the whole time and then I got here and I thought I can't cry in front of everyone. <laughs> And so I think it really affected how I was with all of you as well. I sort of got a bit intellectual and, oh, how's it all going, thinking rather than just feeling my way through the group. So it's all beautiful learning for me. Uh, thank you for that opportunity, all of you. Um, yeah, so there's a few things that I feel would be good for us to recap on last week, uh, different things that happened in the group. And there's stuff that came from other people in other areas that I thought was really beautiful. Um, that, and some of them were quite courageous in different things that they shared, so um, we might recap some of that stuff as well. Now, just before I do that, Igor uh, or Vlad, am I making a sound to make you <laughs> No, it's okay. I've got mentioned trouble before about that, so yeah. <laughs> you can hear it. Alright, yeah. just when I go like that, let's kind of do that a bit. Okay, so during the week I got an email from Marcus who's in Germany and he started a book group about Through the Mists in German because there's quite a few people around the place who speak German as their first language who we know and uh, so I thought that's a lovely initiative of his. But he sent me this comment that I really wanted to share with all of you and he says, I'm puzzled why it seems that no one else felt the same way as I did or noticed the same parallel between Afra and himself, which is, Afra had a great desire to make people conscious of truth, most importantly about the existence of an afterlife. I have a desire to awaken myself and humanity to, f to the fact that there is an afterlife and that there are actually things that humanity in its present condition just labels as wonders that are actually real and that every human being can achieve a condition at one moment from which they could let God work through them and live by example. He says also there is a great parallel concerning the main theme through the mists. I think that also we ourselves can rend the mists invisible by achieving at one moment and we could do it so much better here on the earth plane because basically, almost every being in every condition can be a witness of the great blessings that God wants to give us. I think this parallel between my desires and Afra's desires is quite obvious and relates to a lot of us once you become conscious about it. And I wanted to share my thoughts with you because I didn't see anyone else talking or writing about this parallel. So what do you guys think about that? It's a beautiful sentiment, isn't it? Yeah. Let's have a drink. I wrote back to Marcus and I said, that is so beautiful and moving, Marcus. Thanks for letting, 
letting me know and I'm going to share that with the group. I said, sadly, I think some people here are not as connected to that desire. Mm. What do you think that is, guys? Do you want the mic? I'm still struggling to believe there is a God for one. <laughs> I'm just being honest. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And, and an afterlife because it's just so frightening. Yeah. Horrific, yeah. cruel manipulative <laughs> like yeah. I, I at the moment I can't see any positive yeah and I'm really struggling to see any good in God yeah I, I'm just being honest yeah thanks Deirdre because that's exactly why I feel um a lot of the group here are not as connected with that desire because a, a lot of what I skipped over with you guys last week was the amount of anger that some of you have about the truths that you've received so many people aren't seeing these things as gifts. They feel angry or defiant against them. And I feel that that's why not many are really connected with this desire. And I can even relate it to myself. When I read uh, Marcus's email, I cried because I thought, yeah, this is a desire inside of me. But 12 months ago, even six months ago, I was feeling pretty angry about the whole thing. And I, I felt also that... I can't do it, AJ can probably do it, but I can't do it. And I, there's just too much pain in me <laughs> to consider being able to do this thing. So um, I think that's what I wanted to talk to you guys about largely before we start on chapter three. Some other really brave people emailed me before last week's session. Um, so just to further that theme, um, Elvira in Victoria wrote to me and she said... I realised that while on the surface I was thinking how beautiful the process of passing was for him, so she's talking about reading about Fred and Through the Mists, the underlying dread was how different my experience will be. But that feeling isn't new. I kept telling myself the story that I could still progress from hell in the spirit world and it will in any case be a familiar place. So some hard feelings for Elvira there. Then I came to the realisation that the real terror is that I'm not capable of changing anything and I'm going to be stuck in the hells for thousands of years like the poor souls AJ mentioned. So you can feel Elvira is also feeling this anger and this feeling of hopelessness. Enrique in the US also wrote and he said, I feel desperate and scared at my soul condition and where I will pass into the hells and scared I will not act on my desires. The desperation is all engulfing. It haunts me all day long. I know what to do but can't bring myself to do it and can feel dark spirits affecting me and my allowing it. Because I lack the self-love and my shame is so great. But I also feel hopeful in that I can change and God always provides the first step out of the darkness, no matter how dark we are. That first step out is always with us and God, is always available as are our spirit friends. Yeah, so what he says is very true, isn't it? But that first step is often acknowledging how much anger we have. <laughs> yeah. So who can relate to feeling pretty angry about... Yeah. Yeah, quite a lot of you. Yeah. And we all know from everything we've learnt from AJ is that anger is just the... It's just our... Complete rebellion against the terrible fear and pain that we have inside of us. So really, I'm going to encourage all of you just in your prayers to be really honest with God about where you're at and help him help you <laughs> out of that darkness. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Araya, you had a question. Are you here? You are. Do you feel up to sharing your question uh, with the group? Because it sort of follows on from where we're at. I, are you happy? I can share it if you like. I also brought a print out of your email if you'd prefer just to read it out. Yeah. Do you mind coming a bit closer? or you?
So this was a question that I emailed to Mary um, a couple of days after the book group last week. I woke up today with a huge question troubling me from chapter two. We discussed what a beautifully loving act it was for Frederick to sit with Helen on her deathbed and reassure her a stranger, really, that the children would be looked after and she was able to go into peace and pass. As much as this is such a humanely loving act, isn't God's truth that she wasn't then able to feel and release her fears around it, that he essentially met her need to know they would be looked after, that she would still have those emotions to work through on the other side? This is where I feel so many of us struggle to know how to act lovingly. We know what the world or natural love path would be, but get unclear on what God would do, and then do nothing out of fear to do the wrong thing. I feel this is a lot, I feel this a lot in the group here that there's very little natural or human love shown to each other quite often because of this fear or place of uncertainty because people don't want to fill in others' addictions. Thanks, Araya. I'll just grab the folder back. Jeez. So, um, did everyone understand Araya's question? And does anyone have any remarks before we start talking about it? Do you, do you have the same sort of questions? Do you, what do you feel about all that? Lorleen? Um, there were a few questions when... Um, I can't remember exactly in there, but... I thought, what isn't that natural love um, um, where, like, um, compassion or, or, I forget exactly the point, but um, there seemed to be sympathy given where the person doesn't need to feel it themselves, um, you know, where, do you know what I mean? There's, throughout it. For example, some of the um, uh, very hungry and poor and depraved, I don't know, whatever you might call it, uh, that there is um, sympathy extended. And I kept questioning myself. I said, oh, if I had the same, because I do have sometimes a longing, someone please have sympathy for me and etc. cetera. I, I wondered that this is something that I need to feel um, and yet, in in the chapters, it seems to be okay to give that, if you know what I mean. I know what you're saying. Yeah. Does anyone else have anything to raise? I want to address all of this at once. So, any other questions along these lines, Suze? I what I find these days myself is that when I was in the New Age movement. And when I really didn't know anything, like natural love seemed to be so simple. It was just that somebody would be in distress or there was a good thing that you could do and you just did it. Mm -hmm. And I find more and more now I'm just, I get frozen because I come to a situation and I go, oh my God, it could be spirits. Maybe it's my addiction. Maybe it's their addiction. And it's just this overwhelm of like, oh my God, it's so complicated. Yeah. <laughs> what do you do? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Like, I thank you all for really being honest and open about these issues. And I think this is like, this is what I desired for book group, that we really reflect on what do these teachings mean in our life and what am I learning and how does this translate to my life? So this is a great point I think we've reached already. There's so much I want to say about it and we might get to chapter three next week. <laughs> So let's just launch in and see how I go with expressing everything that's in my heart about this issue because there's a lot. Um, firstly, I also at times feel very concerned about the lack of natural love I see displayed between all of you. Um, not, oh, that's probably a generalisation, not all of you. At different times I see or I hear different things and I think, whoa, whoa, that feels very cruel. Um, someone sharing about their experiences and saying, well, that's your law of attraction. Um, to me, that is just so completely the opposite of what we are trying to teach, <laughs> that I, I get physical pains in my heart <laughs> region. Um, to me, it is the changing of the teachings. It, it is perhaps a, 
No, I can't even call it a misunderstanding of the teachings. When someone is that blunt uh, with somebody else, I feel there is a lot of rage inherent in the statement. And I feel that is because in many of you, there is a lot of rage about the fact that the law of attraction exists and that AJ has told you about it. <laughs> so to me, the law of attraction is like this incredible gift that God has created for me to come to know myself and take responsibility for myself better, to empower me in my life to become more loving and to love other people more. The law of attraction is going to bring me examples of when I'm not being loving. It's going to give me, it's also going to give me opportunities to display love to my brothers and sisters. So very often when somebody is hearing about someone else's woes and they go, well, that's your law of attraction. Wow. That is completely, God has brought you often an opportunity to reflect, to display love to this person in front of you. And many people are so affronted that AJ has said there's a law of attraction that exists. We're so having a tantrum about it that we want to take that anger out on the person in front of us. And we're actually damaging our own soul in that place. Not only that, we're just not loving the person in front of us. And for me, I suppose I feel that the motivation to love should be enough. So that's the first thing that I want, want to say about that, is that many of you are angry. And because you're angry, you're using these teachings to be unloving to each other. We are not teaching you. I have never, ever seen AJ have a person come up to him and he turn around and go, and maybe some of you feel this because he's telling you the truth, but he never with, he's never without compassion. He's never without understanding. He's never without like, fully embracing with his heart the person right there in front of him. He never goes, oh, I can't even relate to this person. Just deal with it. It's your law of attraction. Have, has anyone ever observed that? No. And in fact, it is because of the presence of love within him that many of you are attracted. You hate this bloody law of attraction. You hate all this. But the guy's so loving. And you think, yeah, he's onto something really amazing. I want a part of that. And, and I want, it's so attractive to be around someone who's really loving, isn't it? It feels beautiful because that is really God designed us to respond to love. Yeah. So when, we're, when you guys are using these terminologies, because really it only, it's just terminology if you're then just pushing it around onto each other going, oh, well, you're not really in your passions. Oh, well, where's your law of attraction? Oh, well, you're going to have to... It's, it's a really harsh place to get, get to amongst each other. The truth is God created the capacity for natural love within each of us. That is the love designed for us to give and receive from our brothers and sisters. It is not a dirty word. <laughs> when we connect to God and we receive God's love, we will be able to display love to our brothers and sisters even more. But before that point, we totally have the capacity to love each other. And I feel, like, so passionate about that, <laughs> you know, um, but I feel rather than now beat yourselves up about this, <laughs> the point is to look at why am I interacting with my brothers and sisters like this. Sometimes because we're very angry. Other times, as I think Sue's really um, beautifully expressed, there gets to be a sense of nitpickingness between each of you. Oh, what, are you playing into that? Oh, is that spirit? Oh, oh, what are you... And, that's also telling each other off to the point where someone then gets in anxiety like, should I give or should I not? Is this right? Is this wrong? Really, if you think about the essence of the teachings, it's about connecting to your emotional self. What is in your heart? What is in your soul? Now, if you feel like a desire to give to someone, check out what's in your heart. Am I doing this? Because there's a huge demand coming from this person that I must make them feel better. Oh, if you feel inside your heart, that won't feel really good. <laughs> you, you might feel compelled to do it, but you, you, if you're really honest with yourself, you'll feel that or not. And in that case, what is the loving thing to do? <laughs> well, what does love do? 
just love go, oh, you're just a demanding busybody. And uh, <laughs> Suze, you, what, what do you feel? I guess if you get to that point of clarity, is just to share the truth of what you're feeling. Absolutely. That is the most loving thing you can do in that situation. Is to say, do you know what? I, I feel something really strong coming from you towards me that I need to give you, for, to use Lorleen's example, to give you sympathy. Because I love you, <laughs> I don't feel that that's something that is going to help either of us. Like, it's not going to help me, but it's not going to help you if I just keep helping you do this thing. When I do that, though, I'm not going to be harsh about it. I'm going, to, I'm going to give this person the respect that I would like given to me when I'm in a state of error. And that is that we're all coming from this condition of error. We've all got learning and growth to do. And hey, sometimes it does feel really uncomfortable to, to notice these things about ourselves, to have them pointed out to us. So um, that is exactly what is the most loving thing to do. Thanks, Suze. Nat, you wanted to ask something? Just wait for the mic, yeah. I just wanted to say that um, love has compassion and I find that um, often we don't have a lot of compassion for ourselves and that's why we struggle with other people. Absolutely. And this is, this is an issue I also see, is that everyone is wandering around being so hard on themselves and because they're not willing to soften to these feelings that they have about themselves and just be gentle with yourselves tends to come out then and be harsh on everyone else. Yeah. There's a beautiful part in Corinthians. I should... I, 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 this might waste a bit of time because I don't know my books of the Bible. But um, I just love... Do you all know it? Yeah. Yeah. Corinthians 2. Well, it's pretty popular, isn't it? It's like in your... Uh, it's in lots of uh, wedding ceremonies, isn't it, and things. Well, that's where I've heard it a lot. Yeah. Okay. I actually marked it the other week and now I've lost it. Yeah. I'll come back to it. I'll come back to it, guys. I don't want to lose our train. But it's beautiful. It says that love is patient and kind and compassionate and it's constant. And this is the constancy that we can have with each other. It's, it's just to con be constant, say the truth. This is what I feel in our interaction, you know. Barbara? Um, Mary, I'm not um, compassionate and kind um, most of the time, but there have been some um, occasions in the last... Um, few months in particular where um, um, people have come and asked me questions or I've got involved with them and I haven't really known what to do but I always went back to, well, AJ's always this way with me, my celestial friends are always with this way with me, this is the way I need to be with this person. Yeah. Now some other people would say to me, oh, why are you attracting people like that in your life, you know? Why are you spending time with those people? And I had to say to myself, well, AJ spends time with me when I ask a question. My celestial friends spend time with me when I ask a question. And not only that, they say, ask anything you want to at any time that you want to and <laughs> yes. we'll always be there for you. Yes. So I kept on reminding myself of that and that was my answer, what I needed to do every time. Awesome. Mm. Awesome, Bob. Yeah. Yeah, I, that's, that's wonderful to hear because often I feel like when people are in their head around these teachings, it can get very intellectual. And when we're in our hearts, I think it's a lot different. We remember love first. And yes, sometimes we'll, we will sit and go, wow, I'm attracting a lot of angry women. Perhaps there is something in there for me. But I'm not going to judge the angry women. <laughs> I'm not going to ban the angry women from my life because I know if I really understand the law of attraction in my heart, that as I deal with these issues, those angry women are either going to be affected by the love that's now in me or they won't be as attracted to me and they'll move on. When we try and like gatekeep our life and psychoanalyze it, to the nth degree, we lose the point, and the point is love, and that's what chapter three tells us, isn't it? Everything, everything is ruled by love. 
Yeah, yeah, thanks, Barb. What if we go back? Oh, yeah, Diana. I'm Mary, just reflecting on all that. Like, for me, um, this process of coming to start to recognise um, the truth of myself and the judgments that I have on myself and, of course, the judgments I make on others totally reflect the judgments I have on myself. But how much fear I have, like, um, around just the recognition of those facts of myself. What's inside, that, yeah. Yeah, and how much that has ruled and still does rule me so much, just the fear yeah. of, um, of what it is, how it is to love and because there's a big part of me that wants to learn how to love. Um, but fear often is even, you know, like <laughs> has the greater power than even yeah. that desire in so many times. So you mean the fear of what am I going to uncover if I... Uh if I really engage this situation with this person? If you can give me a practical example, uh, what do you okay. mean? Okay. Um, yeah, I guess just being willing to um, face whatever um, me being loving is with a person in, in sharing a truth or, or just something that I feel is the truth mm -hmm. um, and still my fear of being attacked and yeah. my fear of being made wrong because I've still got, you know, so much yeah. fear around. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and when we love, we're going to be humble to those things, aren't we? We're going to be humble to them, yeah. One of the things that someone said in the group here last week was, I really don't think anyone's our friend except God which sparked me to write on my blog every day this week about a friendship um, because there's a lot of anger in that statement as well, isn't there? There's a lot of feeling that, well, oh, everyone's done me wrong and I don't want to be humble to those, to those feelings inside of me and I don't want to be humble to, to, with my brothers and sisters and be myself and be real and have them be real with me because that's really what friendship is, isn't it? It's, it's giving the gift of yourself or your being truthful and loving with the person in front of you. Yeah. Joy? Um, Mary, just listening to that, I've, it's crystallised it. For me, I feel that when I've been judgmental or harsh or unloving to the other person, it's totally because I'm not willing to be humble and... And it shows my resistance to feeling what's going on with me. There's a direct relationship, I feel. Absolutely. Yeah. Always. Always. Um, but we still need to... Sometimes we use that as an excuse. I guess that's what I'm getting to. Everyone goes, oh, well, I've learned everything about my childhood. I'm full of error. That's it. Pfft, stuff it. I'm, I'm a mean person, you know. And really, if you think about the, the basis of the teaching, it's about growing in love, growing in love towards God and accepting God's love. If we go, oh, well, it's all about error and just give up on the principle of love, we actually can almost harm our soul condition because we end up, we, we awaken to a lot of truths, we suppress and deny them, we get angry, and then we punish the people around us with them or with our denial. So... I feel there's quite a lot to, to have a look at, guys. Last week, uh, somebody told me there's no friends. Ren, you said well, there was a lot of anger in your statement about why is it so hard to learn the truth on earth, um, which there's a lot of pain in there for you. And a lot of that's the thing when we hold on to our pain, we often block the truth that truth does come to us really easily on earth. We have had friends who have been around us and we're not seeing them. So um, if we can look at anger, <laughs> I think that's a great place to start. Hey? Let's go back to Araya's question, which is about Helen on her deathbed and Fred coming to her side and promising to look after her kids. Or well, They're not even her children, are they? They're siblings. They're siblings. Now, for me, it's pretty clear-cut that he's being loving. So let me try and dissect why. <laughs> um, firstly, Helen is in charge of these... By, not, by saying, no, I'm not going to look after your kids, it's your law of attraction, 
you're punishing the children, for a start, who have no involvement in the whole situation. But it's also, it's also avoiding the fact that when we really love, we do have compassion for the people in front of us. We're not saying, well, this is the sum total of your life, you're here on your deathbed, that's, that's the way it stands, you know. Because the truth is, Helen, through differing laws of attraction that existed around her, through the willingness of other people to take and be selfish, she was in an, imp in an impoverished condition. That doesn't mean necessarily that her soul condition is terrible. So by, by also saying, oh, that's it, I'm not helping you, uh, that's quite, it's quite a large judgment to make on Helen, isn't it? But there's much more to it than that. So let me just collect myself a little bit and think about what it is. I, I, said it, I, said, I was at home speaking to AJ about it for an hour and a half and I said, right, babe, that's what I feel. Now see how I go in front of uh, 60 people. Because <laughs> it's all pretty coherent now. <laughs> um, yeah. It's about the fact that Fred was presented with an opportunity to love, and he chose to love in that situation. Array, you also asked about, if I had perfect faith, wouldn't I... Because one of the questions I then wrote back to Araya is I said, well, what do you think love would do in that situation? What would love do in this situation? And if Benu, her, her son, you know, if she was dying and Benu was still with her, what would, she, what would she ask for? And she wrote back and she said, yeah, I, I think that if I had breath in my body, I'd be asking, what's going to happen? Please look after my child. But she said, but if I had perfect faith, wouldn't I understand that he would be cared for? Now, this is, you know, who else feels the same way? Yeah, a little bit, some people, yeah. Okay, it reminds me of, have you all heard the joke about the guy in the flood on the hill? <laughs> and he's going, God, God, save me. And uh, some guys in a canoe come past and say, do you want to hop in? No, no, God's going to save me. And he's pleading, God, God, save me. And someone in a helicopter comes past and says, do you want to jump on? No, no, God's going to do it. <laughs> and he's pleading and pleading and he drowns and he goes, he goes to the pearly gates and meets God and, and he says, why didn't you save me? And God says, I sent you a canoe and a helicopter. <laughs> Remember that love always drives us to act. And so Helen's love for these charges would also inspire her to say, could you look after these people? By, by circumstance, they have been entrusted to me and it is a loving act to care for what happens for them afterwards. So I feel that if she was running around with a gun demanding that people uh, look after her children, now she has no faith. She's in total self-reliance. Can you see what I mean? But if she's asking the person who's presenting to her, presented to her, could you take care of my charges? That, and then she rests in faith of that, that God will take care of things because she's done all that she can. Now she's in a state of God-reliance. So does that clear some of it up for you, Araya? Just wait for the mic. I want to thank you for posing this question because I think it's really great reflection for all of us. So. Yeah, I I just especially appreciate delving into the topic because in my life there's often so much confusion between acting the compassionate, naturally loving way and then all the teachings that we're trying to absorb and learn how to love in the appropriate way and knowing really, um, feeling that love rising and feeling the action and being hesitant in the past out of fear uh, to be doing it wrong. Yep. is where a lot of it comes from for me, I think. Yeah. So some of you get a bit hung up on doing it wrong, but also can you feel the anger? Like, I feel there's anger in it for you as well. Like, oh, I have to deal with my law of attraction. Why would I be taking it away from s for somebody else? There's a very sort of concrete black and white viewpoint, not just for yourself, but many people, about what the law of attraction is. In a talk AJ gave in Melbourne... Not last time we were there, but the time before. I, I really have to find the date. I'll tell you next week. But he, he beautifully explains the law of attraction. The example somebody asks is about an old woman in her house and people um, came into the house and beat and raped her. And someone said, what's her law of attraction? 
And AJ spent about 45 minutes describing the complete law of attraction. Because remember, the law of attraction is acting. It's God's law. It's acting upon all of us simultaneously. So I don't own the law of attraction. I attract different things through my soul condition. So we can't ever just pinpoint one event and go, that's because this person is like this and we should act that way. Love, if we're in connection with, it, with love, love will show us and if we're in connection with ourselves, you know, we're going to feel what, what's in this exchange, what's in this person and what's in me. And that will help guide me to a loving action. So if I can just clarify, I didn't feel that I was asking anything about her law of attraction or saying, I'm not going to help you because of this. My question was really, you know, she's in fear of it. And even if I was knowing that the, I would take care of the kids... Yep. Do I somehow give her the opportunity to, to move through and feel the emotion of fear and what's underneath it? Because you yeah. know, she was in a space of fear in putting it out there. So uh, you know, I, I'm not connecting to the, the law of attraction part of what you're bringing up right now uh, as far as why, I would, why the question came up for me. Okay. So because in saying that somebody is... They have fear in them and they're in this situation. That's, that's through the law of attraction. The law of attraction brings us different events to help trigger emotions. But to go to your question, so to clarify specifically about the fear that she has, I just want you to think about how many times any of you have been afraid when you approached AJ. Is it like pff, two, years. two years of fear? Did he ever go, hmm, rack off? <laughs> You're afraid. Now, sometimes, you know, if it's been two years, he might say, look, you're still very afraid. I can't speak to you right now. <laughs> but the truth is, when somebody is afraid, yes, as Sue's rightly pointed out, we would always give them the opportunity. We would tell the truth, always. Love never avoids the truth. So we would always, at every moment, if we love each other, give each other the gift of truth. And if the person desires it, the opportunity to understand why that fear is in them or how they can release that fear from their life. However, we would not stop acting in love. So when somebody desires a new truth, approaches AJ but they're a bit afraid, he doesn't prevent the loving desire within them in order to teach them about fear. He'll tell them the truth and he'll say, you're also very afraid of men or you're afraid of or sorry, or you're afraid of whatever and I'm teaching you how to deal with that. But we're, it, as it says in the third chapter, God is never punitive, is never punishing. So in, to my mind, Fred did a very loving thing. He, he saw a woman in need on her deathbed and he assured her of two things, didn't he? He, he assured her that he felt that God was a God of love and also that he would care for her children. And those two things gave her a sense of peace and helped her passing. Now, if he had have known the divine truth and if she had have desired to learn about it, he would also definitely have told her, and you know, when you reach the spirit world, there's going to be fear for you to work through, but don't worry, there's loving people around you who are going to assist you in this way. So he would have offered that gift of truth. So does that clarify? Yeah, I think that's really more what I was wanting to be clear is because it is different when we know some truths and we've started learning and we're on this path. I feel like there is an element of growth that we've made to be able to take that next step, whereas Fred didn't have that knowledge necessarily, so he acted basically in natural love and, and having the extra aspect from where we're at right now knowing the further step that is the right thing to take. Absolutely, but can you see that Fred displayed more natural love to his sister than, as we've just pointed out, that many of us are displaying towards each other? And so can you see that we've actually missed a vital element of the teaching, which is love? And truth without love is not the same. <laughs> it's not even truth. It's not even, and it's not going to impact upon the, I can guarantee you that um, someone who got up and presented secrets of the universe in, but it was in the soul condition of the hells, would be very hard for people to absorb what they were presenting. 
the better the condition is or the more love that is presented with the truth, the more, more people are going to be able to receive it, hey? Yeah. Uh, Deb? Uh, I just wanted to um, add something, and it might have been my interpretation, um, but um, in the book it never said that Helen asked. It, uh, the, way I, the way I interpret it was that she was on a deathbed, the, the body's giving out, but she was sort of holding on because of her fear of the children. And if we, as we learn in this chapter, those, the holding on to the children, um, you know, p- pulls the soul back to the earth once they've... They've left the body. Yeah. So I thought that it was the most loving thing for Fred because he gave um, the reassurance that the children would be cared for. I'll see to that. And you can go, go in peace, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yep. The pull back to her children, if it was... Ve- or to the children in her care, if it was very addictive or impure in nature then even his reassurances wouldn't have assisted that. But because her desire was simply to see that they looked after, absolutely, it did, it did help her in her passing. Yeah, yeah. Um, however, we wouldn't... <laughs> let me just get to the point that I'm trying to make. We wouldn't lie. We wouldn't misrepresent things in order to assist a passing. That's what I... Yeah, yeah. Joy? May 2010, thanks, Joy. Do you have that in your diary? No. Oh, in your mind. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So was I. I can't remember. <laughs> Corny. <laughs> um, in that chapter, that was the, actually the only part that actually moved me to tears. Was, and I thought, wow, I'm really off because I didn't get all the God's truth bits and stuff. They didn't, but that part. And it was just because of him, he could feel what was important to her. And it wasn't about, like, the missionaries are trying to teach her how to, like, prepare her soul for death. Yeah. And, um, but he could just feel what was most um, troubling to her. Yeah. Yeah, and just helped, like, address that. Yeah. And I felt that was just such a loving thing to do. And yeah. helped her relinquish the burden she had on herself. Absolutely. And allowed her to pass freely. Yeah. I, I thought that I was... was- beautiful as well and Mm. also that her dying thoughts were not of what's going to happen to me they were what's going to happen to these people that I've been entrusted with which sort of Mm. displays a level of love that was that was already in her hey that she wasn't she wasn't interested in saving her own soul Mm. she was interested in saving the the people who were charged in her care yeah yeah just compassion for people that gets me every time. Like when I see somebody doing something lovely, I just, I just cry. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. A lot of sadness about feeling like you haven't been cared for, do you feel? Um, it's just a lovely trait that's really um, not seen much. Yeah. On this point. And it's so powerful, isn't it? Like it yeah. has the power to change people. Hugely. Yeah. Something that I feel about more and more is about how love is the most powerful force in the whole universe Mm. and if we look around us we're so aj gave a beautiful talk when we were in the us about the power of love over evil and you know it's almost this accepted world viewpoint that we have to be tough and strong and bully our way to get it to get to make sure we're okay and yet time and time again i see that love is the thing that changed people's hearts love is the thing that helps the murderer the most. Love is the thing that... It's, it's the most powerful force in the universe and you're right how little we display it to each other and how powerful it would be if we did. It comes from the most unsuspecting people most times too. Yeah. 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 yeah uh, I have at times said that I've felt more natural love coming towards me from a shopkeeper in Kingaroy than I do sometimes at a talk or after a talk or um, because these people are more committed to just this quality of love of one another. Yeah, so it comes back to the anger, I think, Lorleen. Uh, I think what um, um, Fred has been showing me is that 
that question that I have, which is what do I do, what's loving, because I don't feel I know what love is. Um, and then just be careful about this saying, I don't feel I know what love is. I think it's a big cop out that a lot of us use. If we really feel about it, we've got some pretty strong senses about what love feels like when we receive it what it what love really is but we like to make excuses for ourselves because we go oh it's part of the anger oh well it's all addiction oh well it's all error oh, everything i've done's not been you know and it's actually a, it's actually a sort of anger expressed i feel yeah you know you know if i come and kick you i'm not loving you <laughs> yeah well what i did discover was that cuz i keep using my head and i'll ask everyone well what do you think what do you think and my refusal to go to how do I feel. Yeah. Um, he, Fred, even though he was taught many things by the church and the Orthodox, he kept saying he went back to his own consul and would ask his heart how he felt love would be. Yeah. And in doing that, he would accept the condemnation of going to hell because he felt it was right for him. Yeah. And I think that was a really big lesson for me because I'm always out there, what do I do, what do I do? And in that, what do I do, I get so confused as to what to do because I'm still thinking about it. Yeah. But after feeling that, I've started to just feel, what do I do? And, um, and I notice that when I feel, what do I do, um, what I always felt I didn't know what love was, I do know. And um, the choices I make may vary in degrees of love, but it's learning to trust that. And in doing that also, I've learnt to see that, yes, I do make constant mistakes, but I can give myself compassion for that. And in giving myself compassion to know that I make mistakes, I also feel more compassionate to those around me. Yeah. And I can act accordingly. And it sort of, it is that reliance on all the teachings I hear won't mean anything if I don't filter it through me. Into and your heart. Yeah. Into my heart. And I think I've been doing so much of, I've got to get this, I've got to learn this. And I've done that all my life. Yeah. But now as it filters through, I get so much more. Uh, it could be erroneous, but it just is deeper and that teaches me and takes me further and further. And I find my acts are more loving to me. And that's what he taught me. And uh, that confusion that I constantly have is, is sort of subsiding through that. That's beautiful, Orlean. Yeah, really beautiful. I think Fred is someone with so much integrity, isn't he? He's, he's not lived in a lot of addiction in his earth-based life because he's had a fairly lonely life he hasn't been hooked into the people around him he's been basically condemned by leaders his dad his society um so he hasn't he's already faced a lot of fear and grief in his life on earth and because of that he because of his commitment to this integrity within him he he approaches life in a very um moral and loving way and he he does live it from his heart and um, I, he lives his life in service also. And remember in the first group we talked about how love always draws us to service. And his service was so complete. He served so many people throughout his life. I think that's because he had this integrity to the, to the principle of love. Yeah. But it's beautiful that you share about um, bringing the teachings from your head into your heart. I feel that a lot of um, what happens and all of this trying to get it right thing is all about actually preventing engagement with, the li with our lives and preventing engagement with what our soul attracts. Because as Di said, sometimes it can be very confronting to, to launch into an a, a interaction with Luli and then go, well, okay, I've just seen something full on about my... I've just totally acted in addiction with her or I've just totally projected horrible things at her. So instead of actually living that experience and going through the gut-wrenching, oh, I can't believe that, or oh, the repentance or whatever, we try and second-guess it and prevent and it's all just about avoiding pain. 
And we know that to live this path, we're going to delve into pain. We're going to go in it and through it and out the other side. <laughs> so while we're in our heads trying to figure out the right thing to do, we're, we're often just in the addiction still of avoiding pain. So, yeah. Thanks for sharing, Lorlina. It's beautiful to hear. If you just pass the mic in front of you. And Tim, if you take the mic to Renee for next thing. Hello. Uh, something that I was struck by in this story was how he mentions later on that as a young boy he had to separate himself and he went away to contemplate and, and meditate and consider things. And I think that this is a very interesting part where he actually felt his own grief and sadness mm. and isolation. And then he didn't put it on to others or judge others. In fact, he was judged to be a little bit odd and, as he says, a misanthrope. But in fact, his aloneness was what gave him that grief to feel himself and then... Well, there's actually his courage, wasn't his it? His courage, yes. To feel that grief, to, yes. to take the step to be alone. Sometimes exactly. that's my, my hardest step, is to take myself off and be alone <coughs> with what I really feel. Yeah. Yes, and I think that's how he could feel the love and then he could express that to the others. Yeah. So, so the he, sadness was actually his gift, in a way. As it is, well, With all moving us, yeah. through our sadness is, is, our, is a gift, yeah, that we give ourselves and everyone else, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Renee? Hey, Mary. Hi. I'm still really oblivious to all the anger. Um, I look around and, and I do see that generally there is a, a right, wrong, good, bad that everyone is trying to intellectualise with how they act. But I do feel that everyone is becoming softer. Um, and so I feel as though I'm really oblivious to looking at the anger or... Mm. So if you go back to your question that you asked last week, do you remember what it was? Um, it was about feeling unjust that, you know, God's not there for everyone, um, that it's so hard to know the truth and just a feeling of being so lost and so, searching. Yeah. But there's a lot of anger. There was a lot of anger behind your question that I agree you're not, you're not letting yourself be fully aware of. But the feeling is... Despite everything, despite, despite you being in ownership of this book and receiving all of these beautiful truths about God and the universe, you feel like it's hard to find truth. God isn't there for me. So can you, can you see even intellectually at this point that there's a lot of anger in that place? You're not, you're not recognising that, wow, truth ha has come to me or, or, or that I, I am able to... I've actually had someone stand in front of me for about 75 hours and tell me the exact process of how to connect with God and that God really loves me and I can have a relationship with God. Can you see that those are things that are true, aren't they? You do have this book and someone has to... But your anger is the thing preventing you feeling that truth. So even just your question tells me a lot about the emotion inside. Just like with, with the Ray's question and people making different comments last week about friendship, it tells me that there's anger inside. So maybe something just to pray about. Yeah. 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 And also when we make statements towards each other like, oh, that's your law of attraction or, oh, you know, if we're without compassion, we know there's anger. And sometimes it is because we're so harsh on ourselves that we're willing to be harsh on other people around us. But in the end, that's anger towards ourselves as well. Do you see where I'm coming from? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, Nina? Um, the big realisation for me this week was I've got dreams of helping the starving children and doing that sort of thing, and yet I'm still remiss in serving the people in my immediate environment, my children, yep. um, and still know so very little about what service is. So that's been a bit of a confession. And um, I also watched a movie this week that was brought up a lot, the most beautiful example of how love changes the world and not hate, and that is My Name is Khan, and it's 
K-H-A-N. Yeah, I saw that in the video store and twice I've gone, I should get that. But it's a really profound example yeah. of how love moves the most incredible forces where hate just doesn't achieve anything. So nice. yeah. And I've got it on a flash drive if anyone wants to put it on their computer. Cool. Thanks, Nina. Yeah. Alex? Um, I just wanted to share something I've been feeling really strongly lately, and that is um, whether we like it or not, we've kind of become representatives of this path in in the community. And, and well, when you associate <coughs> yourself with these teachings and openly, then well, people say, w "What are you doing here?" Mm -hmm. And I say, "I'm I'm here for Jesus," you know, and. Uh, say whatever and, and I get to know these people and now I've lived here for two years so um, you know I'm getting to know a fair few people and developing relationships in the community yep. and, and oh, I just feel it's really important that um, a lot of their perceptions of the people associated um, with the divine love path um, are quite negative in some way in what they've experienced mm -hmm. So um, I just, I guess, I'm just really aware of that now, you know, and uh, yeah, um, yeah, I just, yeah. I just feel like it's really important for us to, to feel that, that we are representatives of, of this path. If, we, if we're going to be true, truthful and say we're here because we believe A.J. Miller is Jesus and we're, and we're on this path, and then we need to act in that way as well in the community. Yeah, and not, I mean, not in a pretentious way, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, just I, mean, yeah. I, I mean, I've had very similar feelings, like um, there are, there's a property boom. I said to AJ the other day, did you ever think that you would cause a property boom in your life? Like, that's a pretty bizarre thing to happen. You know, there's a lot of people who, um, who purport to follow these teachings who've now moved here. And as we just pointed out at the start of the group, many people are not living them from a heart space in terms of desire to grow in love or love each other. And certainly the truth is that does have an impact on the community around us. I don't feel our motivation for becoming more loving should be about the community's perception, though. I feel that as we desire more to love more, then the community will respond to that. At the moment, I feel there's a lot of fear in the community, there's anger in the community. Um, there might be other feelings in the community, but they're the ones that I hear about. Um, and that's perhaps because of things that you've heard about happening that are not particularly loving towards other members of the community. I mean, when we just had our first book group, remember I asked everyone, who feels elitist because they know this, this truth? And if quite a few people raise their hand, that, that issue alone is going to affect everyone in the larger community around you because there's already a judgment going out there towards those people. Yeah, so... I, I guess it was just the realisation for me that, um, that whether I, I want to or not, I, if I'm going to speak truth, then I'm going to be associated with this, uh, with this group. And, and um, I don't know, I, I feel a sense of responsibility about that. Hmm. Yeah, I suppose I feel something that I've been feeling about lately is how I feel that I have associated myself very closely with AJ for four years. You can't get much closer. <laughs> um, and yet I have, not been, I have not been living the principles that I'm purporting to uphold. Like, and I, that, you know, I'm sure you've all seen the sleep state presentation and that that to me was such a turning point to say, well, hang on, where is my soul headed? What do I believe? Not just for my own soul, but how am I damaging this path on earth? Like, I don't, I don't want to be doing that. I, I, there are some things that are far more important than me avoiding my pain. And, yeah. So thanks for bringing that up, Alex. That's an interesting point. Yeah. Okay. How are, we, how are we going with all that? <laughs> we're, that's only an hour down. We've, we've still got a whole hour to go. Um, I wanted to talk to you about... I felt quite embarrassed after the end of the last talk. Do you remember I finished the group with the Bible quote from Galatians 
which was about uh, what you sow, you reap. And it, was, it, it ends, the, the passage ends um, uh, relating to serving one another. So if I just read it to you again, um, it says, Do not be misled. God is not one to be mocked. For, what, for whatever a man is sowing, this he will also reap. Because he who is sowing with a view to his flesh will reap corruption from his flesh. But he who is sowing with a view to the Spirit will reap everlasting life from the Spirit. So let us not give up in doing what is fine, for in due season we shall reap if we do not tire out. And if you think about it, that's Fred's whole experience in the spirit world, isn't it? He was sowing these amazing, beautiful seeds of service his whole life. And, and when he arrived, he was welcomed with all this love and all of his inherent uh, enthusiasm and inquisitiveness for life could suddenly spread wings and fly into, um, into, like, into being. So. But the last part, which is what I want to talk to you about, um, says, really then... As long as we have time favourable for it, let us work what is good towards all, but especially toward those related to us in the faith. And I I feel I was quite glib and I went, yeah, I don't don't agree with that last bit. And uh, I finished the group and AJ, he didn't didn't even have to say anything. He just said it back to me and I went, oh, can we delete that part of the DVD? (laughs) I can't believe I've been so glib. Um, So what do you think it refers to when he says there, but especially towards those related to us in the faith? Why is that actually a valid statement? If we go to Carolina. Um, Just like you become a family, so we start treating each other like that I can yell at you or I can yuck. Exactly, exactly, that it is very often the people who are closest to us that we feel most okay with treating badly. And if you think about the start of our discussion, it was all about how we're seeing this pattern of treating each other really harshly. So I believe now that he said that because he wants us to especially look at those people who are close to us and if we are treating them with love and serving them. So my apologies. That came through some very strong childhood filters about Christianity and uh, segregation uh, that don't even apply. So, so I'm glad I got the chance to clear that up because it's actually mentioned again in Chapter 3. Yeah, okay. Any other comments or questions about that? No? Okay. Just working through my list of things. Yeah. So the last thing that I really wanted, to, before we start into chapter 3, talk about was just, I don't know how clear I made it last week. There were a few things that we asked questions about, um, you know, Fred's statement that heaven is a, as much a condition of the soul as it is a place. And he's expressing so much emotion, isn't he, as he works through his story about just how wonderful everything seems to him. And he uses a lot of metaphor and uh, different ways of expressing that. So he's, he's so overwhelmed to see, he- see Helen. He says, I'm in heaven. It's, it's wonderful. And, um, and then we think, oh, is that true? Is that heaven? Or is that, you know, is that just a metaphor? And it can get all very intellectual. And what I wanted to point out is that what we'll see as we go through, hopefully we're going to make it through all three books together, or some of us together, even if it's just me and Vlad and Lena and Igor, <laughs> a few of you in the, in the audience, um, that I'm dedicated to that. But um, is that Fred's, Fred even becomes Afra, you know, he, he changes his name because, because of the different truths that he learns and what he, what he wants to express in his life. Um, but is that Fred's understanding grows and changes as he goes and that sometimes we're going to come across things like in chapter 3 where they may not be specifically God's truth but things are explained to Fred in ways that he will understand and they're also by people who are in a certain level of development. So if we can just honour the narrative as it goes and we can talk about it and highlight it as we go on but just that... Fred is sharing with us in a very humble manner everything that he experienced, his impressions, 
and he makes me he made me giggle quite a few times in this this last chapter because he's he's so humble it's almost like funny he's like oh I was never an enthusiast I was just this grumpy old man and you think that's crazy you spent your whole life serving people and like you you explored yourself so much that you could decide that this is the way I'm going to live my life I can't see you as very grumpy but um He's just so humble and he's so willing to share of himself. And so if we can just keep that in mind, that his, his narrative is unfolding as it goes and we're going to learn higher truths with him as well. So I don't know if um, many of you recognise how higher level truths have already been presented to you, like things from spheres well beyond the third, fourth, fifth, sixth and seventh sphere have been presented to you by AJ and... And Afra is entering the spirit world, I think, you know, in the second sphere. And so even the people who are assisting him are still working through things and don't understand the full, full truths. Yeah, so as long as we can be aware of that. Renee? I found it really beautiful that he, he did make reference to himself, that other people... Well, what he thought other people saw him as was selfish and boring and and all that sort of stuff. And then how different that is in God's truth and God's eyes and how beautiful his soul is. So whatever it seems superficially, there's always something that's really beautiful in God's eyes underneath that. Yeah. So that really affected me, that, that yeah. part. Nice, nice, yep. Yeah, no, I, I like how frank and open he is about his earth experience and, yeah and how we get to see the rewards that he has for living such a life full of integrity. Mm. Lolene? Um, Mary, just going back to those comments that were sent in earlier, Mm -hmm. um, I had mentioned to you a similar one, my fear of going to the hells and what do I do about it, and... um, it's plagued me, yeah, day and night. I always am afraid that's where I'm going to be when I die. And your answer to me was that um, you only stay in the hells um, when you don't wish to try and um, process your, you know, emotions. And um, as simple as that sounds, that gave me a huge amount of relief just to know that it's my willingness to to um, release what my errors are that will keep me or not keep me in the hells. Yeah. And um, I felt that when you said that, those questions from these uh, other people, that if they could feel that, it gives a lot of hope because it really, really depends on yourself then. Definitely. Yeah. So if we talk about that a little bit more... Um, Because I thought those people were very brave to really say, yeah, this is lovely hearing about Fred, but this is what I feel inside of me. I feel desperate, you know. I'm not doing well enough and and these feelings. I think in our discussion I talked to you about will, didn't I? That if you have a will and a desire to grow towards love and to change, to face yourself, then you're always going to be assisted and you're always going to have the capacity to move from a space of darkness. Now, many people go, oh, but I'm not humble and I'm not feeling my emotions and I'm not... And the truth is, yeah, while we continue to act in ways that are unloving towards each other, it does have a penalty upon our soul. It does affect us. God's law is exacting and it doesn't shift. He's constant in his love, which means that he doesn't shift and go, oh, yeah, I'll let you off on that one. Um, Because it means that you you haven't healed an issue of love inside of yourself. But the most beautiful gift he gave us is our will. And if we decide, I, 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 want, to, I want to change, you know, I want to grow. And if we ask for help, it is always brought to us. In the spirit world, tangibly, you know, somebody comes immediately and says, here's how I can help you. It's, the whole system is designed in that way. So... So, yes, we do need to take responsibility for the harm that we've done to ourselves and other people in this life. Or we will go to a place of darkness. 
There's no... Uh, in, in, um, in chapter 3, he talks about repentance. And I'd love to talk a lot about repentance when we get to it in the chapter. But just quickly, he says that... Or, um, is it Eusmos? How do, you, how do we pronounce that? Eusmos. Um, says that um, the church viewpoint of uh, repentance... It doesn't work, you know. You can't just go, yep, okay, I accept Jesus as my saviour and that's it, you're, you're, you're out of the hells. The same thing applies for us where we can't just go, oh, well, I know Jesus, I know all about spirit, well, that's it, I'm all right. There's still, there's still the issue of what we've done with our lives and what we're doing towards ourselves and towards others that we're going to have to come to terms with. Uh, here, we can do it here or when we enter the spirit world, so... So, yeah, but if we use our will in that direction, things are going to change. Barbara? One of the beauties of Chapter 3 is um, all about repentance. Um, and um, one point that was really highlighted was nothing stands in the way of immediate and absolute forgiveness except man himself. Yeah. Yeah, and that's just beautiful. It is. It is. Yeah. That God's constantly there. Yeah. Yeah. And we're reminded throughout all of the three books that what you just touched on then, the, um, the beauty of all you have to have is a slight change in your soul's desire and help will be there immediately. Yeah. Like the celestial spirits are just standing, waiting for that desire to be there. Absolutely. Just as they are right now. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Yeah, Yeah. it's as beautiful, isn't it, the way it's designed. Yeah. Jen, did you have a question? You had your hand up. Or a comment? Um, Several times on the path I've reached a place of the deepest despair and um, not talked to anyone about it and just didn't even really know that I was sending it to God. And... On those occasions, um, the law of attraction has brought um, the profoundest gifts, the meeting of a person along the road, um, a conversation that brought an answer of truth, Um, the comment comment from a parent whose child was struggling at school and has now turned the corner. And in those moments, I... Um, have felt the closest to God than um, I ever could have imagined and felt a sense of peace and relief that that there really is something out there and although in those moments perhaps it's not the optimum way to make connection um, I felt encouraged to keep going and grow and keep keep at it yeah do you know what it reminds me of Jen is that so we we know that we have this possibility of a personal relationship with God don't we that we can receive we can make a personal connection with God and we can receive love from God but also God has created this whole universe with loving laws that govern everything and so even like you're in deepest despair and maybe you didn't even connect to God but the love that that God has engineered into everything brought you something that helped you see something or helped you grow or helped you shift or helped you feel something yeah so it's like there's all these parameters that God has set out that are all loving that that bring us things as well yeah okay should we just launch in and talk about repentance then because that's the juicy part of this chapter (laughs) It's a beautiful chapter, isn't it? And and he, so Fred's in the spirit world for we don't know how long now. Um, and he starts the chapter, you know, in his funny way saying, I'm not an enthusiast and I'm not anything. But here I'm just like totally into everything. And uh, to me that says that he's very modest and he's also uh, just eventually arrived in an environment where his true nature can thrive. It wasn't there before. But one of the major themes that they talk about is repentance. And what I wanted to ask you guys is to tell me what repentance is. (laughs) Beautiful joy. (laughs) Um, 
repentance is really feeling in my heart and soul how really sorry I am for the harm that I've caused to others by my actions, by my unloving behaviour. Um, to the point where I ask God for forgiveness um, with a desire that I'll never want to do it again. Okay, yep, there's more to it. <laughs> Rochelle? But yes, you're right, there's just more to it. Um, being willing to feel the cause as to why I took that unloving action in the first place. Yep, so and what... What drove me to do that and also feeling the sorrow of the harm I've caused and feeling the, what that would have done to the other person yep. as well. Yeah, yeah, good. Any more, Ange? If we go to Ange. Uh, directing all of that to God. Yeah, so involving God in the process, definite part of it. Uh, Sandra? Asking God for forgiveness. Yeah. Okay. Still more. Uh, Nat? A willingness to feel the pain that you actually caused the person you've harmed. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Any more? If we go to... Ella, plus Ella. all those other things. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Plus all those other things. Yep. Um, Geraldine. Oh, I nearly called you Eloise. Um, Natalie sort of said it. I was going to say um, I often have these experiences of processing where I'm processing some way that I've been hurt, feelings about how I've been hurt, and it's, like, really painful. And then all of a sudden, in the midst of that, um, I'll suddenly drop into an experience of... I'll have that an image of some person in front of me and I'll think, what that got to do with this yeah. and I'll resist it and then I'll eventually let myself go there and this huge um, awareness of what I've done to them. In avoidance of this issue that you're feeling about, is that... It's just there. It just yeah. spontaneously comes up. I feel that that's what's happening, yeah. You're connecting to an emotion that, um, that you've been avoiding for a lot of your life and in that avoidance, you've caused harm to other people. So when you connect to that emotion, then you go, oh, and that, there's, that's what I've done as a result of this, and that's what I've done as a result of this. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and then I'll feel this incredible pain about um, the fact that I've done this to them, the pain. I'll, I'll feel this, like, pain which is way, 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 way worse than the pain I was feeling about having been hurt. Yeah. Like the pain of what I've done to them. Yeah. Is that yeah. remorse? Or is that uh, repentance? Or? Yes. Yeah, it's mm. part of repentance, yeah. Mm. I'll, I'm going to give you the my... AJ wants to add something. <laughs> it's possibly... And a willingness to take action to co completely correct the wrong that you committed... And yep. in particular towards the people you'd committed it to. Yeah. So m my five-point uh, checklist for repentance <laughs> is firstly I have the intellectual awareness that I have done something to harm another person. That's where it's, I've got to firstly see it with my head. Sometimes I have been so blocked and resistive that I don't even see with my head that I've done anything harmful to somebody else, even though I might have the person telling me. Um, <laughs> not nice, huh, babe? <laughs> um, so I have to have the intellectual acknowledgement. Then I go to the space of having the emotional acknowledgement. Wow, I've been out of harmony with love here. I, I, you know, it's just an emotional acknowledgement that I feel in my heart that I haven't been loving in this situation. Now, most people stop there and go, that's repentance, and it's not. That's just the little first stepping stone. Within it is the desire to experience the pain that I have caused in the other. I want to feel the pain that, that, I've, that I've actually created in them. That's, if, if I'm really repentant, that's what I want to do. I don't want to avoid that. I have a desire to do 
every single thing I can to correct the harm that I have done. So that's what AJ was referring to, that I will go to any length possible to correct that harm. To stop, to, um, if I've harmed a child, if I've harmed a friend, if I, I will, the true state of repentance will compel me to want to reverse whatever I can. And the last thing that I had on my list is the desire to find the emotional reasons inside of myself why I did this thing and to remove this reason so I can never do the thing again. Now, within all of this, I'll be involving God. So I'm, I'm talking to God about this. But I won't just ask God for forgiveness. I will, if I've harmed joy, I will go to joy. And I, if I'm really repentant, I will say, will you forgive me? I've done a large wrong to you. And even if joy says, no, no, it's nothing. Don't worry. People are like that all the time. I'll say, no. <laughs> Really, this is, this is a serious thing and I'm sorry. I'm, and I'm really sorry that I've added to this sense that you feel that this is normal because this is, I can feel inside of myself this is not loving. Yeah. So that's what I feel the full process of repentance is. And it's not something that usually happens when we just have one cry. It's something, it's a process. And there's layers to it. And we think we've like cleared that bit and then God shows us another layer another part of it where we've, we've, we can see that, the, oh, there's that other pain. You know, when, when we have children and we affect the way that they feel about themselves or the, the, our particular gender, we not only impact on themselves and their self-image, we impact on their soulmate relationship, we impact upon their following their desire, we impact on huge amounts of huge things that are in their life. <laughs> it's okay, and <laughs> You've got a will. And a desire. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but there's a lot to it. Geraldine? So, um, sorry, I'm not completely clear about this. Um, mm -hmm. I notice when I have that experience, for instance, I had that with my younger sister, um, I realised that I'd been projecting something at her for years and years. And um, I then had a desire came up in me to tell her and yep. to own it with yep. her. But I'm just thinking about that now, and you know, which I, of course I haven't done. I kind of felt like oh, I couldn't possibly do that. Um, <laughs> Why is that? Uh, I guess um, it, it brings up a lot um, more, and would probably end up arguing. <laughs> Can you see though, if you're repentant, you wouldn't want to enter an argument. It just wouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. And also, um, sometimes we say, "Oh, I couldn't tell them that because that's just going to hurt them more." When the truth is. They've been hurt by the projection and mm. they've, they've felt it on a soul level, absolutely. Mm. So the, the, the desire to own and acknowledge it and, and if you have to do it from a space of feeling repentant though. Mm. If mm. you just tell them, oh yeah, I've been projecting at you, yeah, you know, that can actually be a more damaging thing. It's like I'm projecting at you and now I'm telling you I'm projecting at you if we still have the injury inside of ourselves and we want to punish the person. So, but if you in a process, crying about what you've done to your sister mm. and you suddenly feel compelled that I need to own this in our relationship. Mm. This is a glimmer of repentance. Mm. When you come out of that space and go, oh, no, I can't do it, and we just argue anyway. Yeah, now you've stepped away from that humble space. At the time, I felt um, very strongly that I would like to do it, although, yes, I didn't, I didn't do it. Yeah. Um, when we're repentant, we want to take we, responsibility for this thing. We, yeah. we want to say, this, mm. is, this is a wrong thing. We don't want to justify or minimise or shift the blame or any of those things. We say, I'm responsible for my soul. I use this soul in this direction and I'm going to own that. I'm going to say, it, was, it starts and ends with me, you know. So yeah. I just did a bit of it then. There's a whole heap more, obviously. <sighs> To still do. Definitely. Mm. And Geraldine, the fact that now you feel like, oh, I'm just going to argue with her, tends to indicate that you, there's a lot more there. Mm. And the causal reason why you've been projecting that at her mm. is, is uncovered, is still covered. Mm. The fact that you feel that you still could argue with her means that you're not really feeling that sorry. <laughs> I can imagine her blaming me. <laughs> I can yeah. imagine her taking the opportunity to just leap on me really viciously. 
And if we're repentant, what would we do? Oh, AJ is jumping out of his chair. If we're repentant, we'll want to say, yes, I am to blame. Yeah, Yeah, I feel that one reason why a lot of people don't enter repentance is because they feel that if they bear their soul and say they're sorry and take take the blame, the other person who um, will get angry with them and tell them that you are to blame. Yeah. And, and the reality is you are to blame. You're the one who did it. Of course you're to blame. And, yeah. and, of, and, and the other thing that's important to understand is that person, if they're feeling angry with you, they have the right to be angry with you. You've just been damaging them for years. Of course they've got a right to be angry yeah. with you. And if you're not willing to sit there and take their anger without, without getting angry back, then you're not really repentant. Yes. You're not, just not yet repentant. Because remember, we, we want to feel all the pain that we've caused in this person. If they're angry, there's a lot of pain inside of them. There's a lot of feeling, you know. And if, if I'm really repentant, I will go, wow. And now this person is in a rage with me, you know. That's, I've done this. I've put this out there onto this person. They've hurt and hurt and hurt to the point that now they're in a rage with me. And, and if I'm really repentant, I'll go, that's because of what I did. Barbara? Um, that's very interesting what Geraldine did. I had a case um, with my sister about 12 months ago where after one of AJ's talks I realised that I had um, caused the dynamics within my family between my sister and myself and I had always felt this um, feeling where I could never connect with my sister even from a little child and I just always thought, oh well, my sister, she's caused that feeling. I had never looked back on myself and turned the mirror on myself. And in your workshop, you got us to do that. Um, And then I realised, well, okay, I did feel as if I did a little bit of repentance and I was strong enough to send her an email and I pointed this out to her. It all came up after my father had passed. And I pointed out where I had caused this problem in, in in our life and the relationship and that... I had set up the dynamics and I explained to her how it all had happened. But I felt as if I hadn't gone the full way in that I was open and honest to her. And I expected that I was going to get shit back. I really did. But I still sent it. And the next day, well, no, not even the next day, immediately I got a page email back from her and she just gave me so much love in that email, which I totally didn't expect. So who was being the humble one in that situation? Yeah. Yeah. My yeah. sister who didn't know the truth and one who did know parts of the truth. Yeah, yeah. So you, you were humbled by her humility and that she didn't want to punish you uh, for something that you were... Yeah. Um, yeah. But she also wanted to open up the dialogue for more discussion. And I, awesome. And, but I wasn't willing to do that at that ah, stage. Okay. Yeah. I, I didn't shut her down completely, but I haven't gone there. Yeah, yeah. Else. yeah. So still some fear there. There is still some fear. Yeah. Yeah. And often, you know, when we're children growing up, and if it's been from a very early age... It was all of our life. Yeah. Remember that we're reflecting what our parents, the dynamics between our parents and their different emotions our parents are projecting at us as well. So remember, repentance is not self-punishment. It is not like beating yourself into the ground and saying, I'm a bad person forever. It's, it's, that's actually an avoidance of repentance as well. So just be careful of that as well, Barb, because I know that... Yeah. yeah. I feel, though, I've, I did some of the steps, but I haven't completed it. That's yeah, what I feel course. after those yeah. points have been yeah. pointed out yeah. now. Because when you get to the causal reason, you'll be able to, like, grieve. You'll still have these feelings of um, wanting to hear from her and know what happened for her and feel what happened for her and... Do everything you can to correct what happened. But you'll also forgive yourself and you'll see the reason why this you were displaying this thing, you know, which will actually be some hurt in you from the family dynamic as well. Yeah. One of the beautiful things on that that was pointed out to me from our celestial friends was that um, um, they showed me a case where um, my sister and I were interacting and my sister was very jealous of me and that's what I always just thought, well, my sister's just jealous of me. That's... The immediate 
connection I was having with her all the time and dismissing her feelings. Mm -hmm. But what they got me to do was turn around and look at what was going behind from me. What was I doing to cause her to be jealous? Yeah. And I was actually putting her down. Yeah. And I was wanting her to feel less than what she really was. Yeah. And yeah. And that's where I have to feel the repentance and that's what I haven't done. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. That's a great place for you to go, Barb, because yeah. I know that a lot in your youth, because um, you're very pretty, that there was a lot of things that happened for you, wasn't yeah. there? You yeah. you learnt some addictive things yeah. that got you knew how to get your own way and yep. there'll be a lot of repentance around yeah. men and women through that process. There is. So there that's is. awesome yeah. that you're opening up to that. Oh, cool. Okay, any more? Uh, Deb? Um, I've got a sister question. Um, <laughs> um, my, my relationship with my sister was just like a full-on war my whole, my whole childhood up until 18 when she got married. And I've been very... Well, I've been remorseful over many years about what I did to her and how much I painted myself to be the good guy. And But really, you know, because she was very mean and I was very mean, is the truth. We've yeah. both been cruel. Yeah. Um, and so I've been processing it a little bit this week and I came up with a question, well, she was reflecting my mother's attitude to me or my mother's stuff or my father's stuff. But then I go, well, but I wanted her dead when I was a child. I dreamt that she died and I was happy mm -hmm. because I thought our family would be happy if she died. So I have this big question about what's... I, I consider already that it's my total responsibility because I willed it. It was my free will. But it was... There was so much... must have been so much stuff going down with mum and dad that I don't know the line. Well, it's similar to what I just said to Barbara, isn't it? You're going to own these feelings inside of yourself, but you're going to ask God to help you to find the causal, the causal reason why they're there. And that is going to be about the dynamics that happened within your family. But you, you're going to, through the process of repentance, you're going to acknowledge that, yes, these feelings entered me from outside, but then I used my will... Like until the point when she was 18, I used my own will to be nasty and cruel and all of those things. So that had an impact on my own soul. So it's like everything that's inside of us now, we can trace it back and say, yep, that's because of mum or that's because of dad or whatever. And that's the truth. But when we've, it's entered us and we've used our will in that way, it comes back to us and we do, we do have to heal it inside of us. Yeah. And we'll want to. And it's painful. It is painful at times. Yeah, yeah. Does that like, answer your question? Uh, yeah, I guess just if... And maybe AJ's answered this on a tape I haven't heard yet, just around what age a child, you know, at a young age, they're just totally reflecting their parents. And at what age is it them and not parents? As far as... I don't know. Look, I fought back. I fought like a banshee, so, you know. So really what I'm feeling in your question is this internal feeling that you have of, I don't want to take responsibility for how nasty I was. Yeah. And I feel that's where you need to start, Deb. Yeah. It'll come clearer when you're happy to, to really acknowledge it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. All right. Anything more on repentance? It's a good topic, Sandra. There's this feeling that I had the other day about if someone doesn't know what you've done to them, that they still feel it in their soul. And mm -hmm. it's really painful to feel that they know what I've done to them. It was a huge like, a realisation that no matter what I've ever done to everybody, sooner or later, they'll, it's actually in their soul and they will feel this from me and that I caused it. And it, it kind of um, it made me feel... Yeah, it was it was painful to feel because yeah. obviously when you're feeling the pain of what you've caused to them and then knowing that they actually feel that pain and they know it's coming from you, it's like, yeah, you just become so exposed to, you know, to the whole universe that, yeah, I've done this and yeah. I must take full responsibility for this. Yeah, yeah. And I also have a question. Um, oh, just on that, though, when yeah. we pass into the spirit world, it becomes even more transparent, yeah. doesn't it? And we see that as the book progresses as well, that you visually see these things coming and going between people. But it's true that our soul is so powerful that what we project outwards, it, it does reach people. Um, but if you flip that over, think about it in, in relation to love. 
Imagine if there was love coming out of us towards everyone. How powerful would that be? Yeah. Mm. yeah. Just go on with your question yeah. and then we'll come and, forward um, to Renee. Just a question about when we re feel a bit of repentance, I'm not saying I've ever really felt full repentance, but it feels like the person you're feeling towards and when you've had a lot of clashes with that person, I don't know, it just feels like you're so connected so much more than with any other person because it seems like they were the teacher that, that allowed you to feel these emotions that, and, the, you know, the, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know be careful is... about calling them a teacher because you've harmed them yeah. and then you go, oh, thanks for that. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's sort of not a repentant place. Yeah. Uh, it's sort of like, thanks for being my punching bag. Um, yeah. yeah. It's just like a, the, a weird The truth is when something, like if, if I've been angry at my sister and, and I enter a state of repentance, so that's been coming out of me all this time towards my sister, when I repent that stops coming out of me towards that person. Um, and actually, hopefully, if I fully engage the, the process of repentance, a whole heap of other feelings start going towards her which are L loving yeah. and desirous to assist her and desirous to, you know, yeah. let her know what I've done and all of those things. But I, I just feel that there's some, some lessons about repentance, Sandra, for you to, to pray about as well. Yeah. You know, uh, feeling like... I feel like there's still a lot of anger for you. Remember last mm. week you were saying about how you just feel um, that you don't want to let go of anger, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah. yeah. And, and like, I can relate to that feeling too, hey? Yeah. I've been very angry for a long time as well. Mm. But there will come a point where... And you can hasten this point to pray about the pain that you're causing th the people around you, but also yourself, you know. Yeah. Um, so if you can do that, I feel that this whole process of repentance will open up for you more in a heartfelt way. When you feel like someone's your teacher, when you've been hurting them, we're definitely missing the mark of what repentance really is. Yeah. 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 And also a guilt as well. Like, you know, at the beginning it feels like for me, at the beginning when I feel that I've done something wrong or something, I've harmed someone, the guilt is really hard to get over, like this whole self-punishment what you mentioned earlier, and to get to that place of really owning it rather than feeling guilty and allowing spirits to make you feel sick. Yeah. <laughs> That's, like, I think it's a very big issue for most of humanity as well. Yeah, I feel like anger is more of an issue yeah. for humanity and a desire to avoid responsibility. Yeah. Uh, I do feel that self-punishment is a big trap, but often that is a place we go to because we want to avoid responsibility yeah. in the bare bones of it. That's why we do it. Uh, and guilt, I am coming to feel that guilt is a feeling we do pass through as well. It doesn't necessarily have to be a pothole, but sometimes we do feel guilt because we have done something mm -hmm. horrible and guilt is sort of our soul telling us, hey, hey, yeah. hey, there's something here. It's this pain. Is not good, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. AJ, maybe you can be more clear than me about that. So. And guilt is often a narcissistic trap in the sense mm. that it, it helps us to be more involved in our own emotion than it does in the pain that we've caused another person. And so what, what that means is that we have a tendency then to say, oh, look at my hurt about having done this, when, when your own hurt about having done something is, is a lot easier than the hurt that you've actually created in the other person. So... Yep. So we've got to be careful with guilt. There, there are true feelings of remorse, which are different to guilt, but guilt is often just this trap of narcissism, of being self-involved, rather than actually seeing the pain that we've caused another. We're just feeling in pain ourselves instead. Mm -hmm. And it's just, in, 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 a, in a lot of ways, what we're doing is continuing to harm the other by saying, yeah, I did that to you, but my pain about it's worse than yours. Yeah. And it's I pretty bad when it. you think about it. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So to use your clarification then, AJ, we could say guilt is the pothole <laughs> that we go down into. Guilt is the self-punishing. It's all about me. I'm a bad person. Oh, I can't believe it. That's the pothole we can get stuck in. Whereas remorse is more a feeling we'll pass through. Remorse is the acknowledgement. Those first two steps that I talked about, intellectual acknowledgement, heartfelt acknowledgement, I've done something wrong. And then we can use that as the pathway to re repentance 
Do you agree with that? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, Nat? Just while we're on the topic of guilt, is shame then um, a trap that we create for ourselves? Because I know that when I've been unloving to myself and I have an intellectual awareness of it, I often feel ashamed of what I've done, mm -hmm. but that I can catch myself doing it. So I'm not, not sorry to the point that I will stop doing it, yeah. but I'm still ashamed of what I've done. And yet I find myself reflecting going, holy crap, I just did it again. Yeah. So to me that is sort of guilt. Okay. I, I mean, what I feel about shame... And I'm, again, this is one of these things where I'm just in the process. I'm not at the destination. So I have a lot of shame inside of me. And I feel like shame is an emotion that I have about myself directed towards myself, which says I'm filthy, dirty, yucky, I'm a horrible person. And it feels to me like that I actually have to process that feeling it's not even yet at the causal. The causal feeling is the grief about those things and the grief about being made to feel those things, like being treated in a way that made me feel that way about myself. I feel like that's the causal thing. But I feel like the shame is something that I, that I work through. I feel like guilt is the thing that happens where I go, oh, it's, it's more self-punishing and the pothole and... And perhaps, perhaps I'm wrong, perhaps what you're saying is the shame, you are feeling shame, but you're not willing to experience it. Just the shame pops up. You go, oh, I've done something shameful, Ooh, but I don't want to feel about it, so then you can do it again. Whereas I feel like when we're really open to our emotions, we'll experience shame, and when we experience shame, we won't do any more things that make us feel shameful, and then we'll get to the grief. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, no worries. Renee? For me, um, when I was young with my sister, I had, um, I, w I am still very self-absorbed self and always wanting attention and I missed her through my growing up days, through my very young days. When you say you missed her, you mean you didn't really notice her? Yeah, yeah. like she followed me and wanted to come with me with things and she's only a year younger than me but... Um, I missed her in the care for her. Like, I recognised that only many, like, well, very late in life that I um, didn't care for her and didn't see her. And um, So when you say care for her, you mean not physically look after, you mean love her? Love her, yep. yeah, yep. not physically yep. look yep. after, love her. And um, I was always very, I still am angry and have a lot of rage and I feel that um, I, um, just, um. so Renee, sometimes when we get a lot of attention as a child, um, it's hard for us to give up the feeling that we should get the attention. And then every time in life when we don't get all of the attention, we get angry. <laughs> and that's why sometimes you can end up being in a rage all the time because as a child, an error entered us. And the error was, I deserve all the attention. Um, is that... N n no, that wasn't what I was going to say. Um, but, um, but yes, that's, I can relate to that as well. Yeah. But um, what I did want to share was that I... <sighs> felt I never had, I missed her and I didn't know who she was and I recognised that very late in life and decided I really did want to know her yeah. and um, I've spent many years working on myself in a way, uh, I didn't know there's deeper, a deeper way now yeah. um, and I felt like I recognised that in myself, that I, I wasn't there for her and in a loving way and didn't see her and um, I went back and I said to her, um, I was humble and I shared how much I had missed her and I um, um, just missed her altogether. And, and 
in the process of that, I felt like I repent. I felt like I went through a repentance because I had a willingness to actually get through it. Um, I'm sure there's deeper places, and I've only yeah. done it um, one of the onion layers, and there's plenty more. Can I can I suggest that you did the first two steps? You went. Sure. I in my head, I did something wrong. In my heart, oh, I did something wrong. Oh, I'd like to correct that. Yeah. But where I think the stumbling block was feeling about the causal reason why it happened. And that is actually about what I was just talking to you about earlier. And that's how, you know how you said, I've still got anger, I still want attention, all those things. That's when you clear that away, you'll be able to be fully repentant with your sister. And you'll want to feel more the pain that she has as a result of, what, of those things. Because what I was angry about a lot of the time too was that um, I didn't feel there was love. There was no love, always angry. No, there's no love here, there's no love here. And when I expressed that to my sister, I just felt all this love and I was a bit overwhelmed with the fact that it wasn't the way it looked yeah. and it wasn't how it was when I actually did open to her yeah. and went, oh my God, like I can feel all her love and where have I been? It was me Angry. who yeah. wasn't around. And yeah. So it was quite... A That's the topic to of the, the blog post today about friendship when anger stops us seeing love. And that's what I was trying <laughs> yeah. to express yeah. anyway. Yeah, Just awesome. Struggling to express awesome. it. Thank you. Thanks, Renee. Yeah. Jen? I'll just keep an eye on our time. Yep. My question's about how God steps in. How does. I don't have a clear understanding of how the law of compensation, um, you feel the pain in your heart and so you're in the law of compensation because you've done harm. And, and when you enter the spirit world, it actually becomes physical pain as well. Wow. And your environment reflects what you've done. Like It becomes a total sensory experience of the law of compensation. Wow. So then... I'm not clear on how um, when you long to God um, for um, the word I feel is relief, mm -hmm. which is probably not repentance, is it? Um, not really. A bit telltale. It's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> all right. <laughs> Keep going with your question. Do you, you long to God? Yeah. My question is not so much about me. Let's <laughs> let me hide, <laughs> please. Um, it's about how the laws work. Okay, so how they match together, and yep. um, I'd like to understand that clearly. Okay, let's let me have a stab at it. We'll see how I go. Um, my understanding of the laws, from the condition I'm in at the moment, is that the law of compensation is is the the wheel that grinds very finely. It, God sees, as we saw in chapter 1 or 2, God sees everything that is in our soul. The, the things we've done to harm others, the loving things we've done. It's all there. It's all laid out at every moment. There's no judgment that we pass. But, and the law of compensation is acting upon our soul in terms of pain. It is, it is the experience of the... Remember I said about repentance. So if I've harmed Luli, I, I um, desire to feel the pain that she must feel as a result of my harm. The law of compensation is God enacting that process upon my soul. It, he's saying there's harm you've caused others, there's harm you've caused others, here's the pain of it. But I'm using my will in the opposite direction. I don't want to acknowledge that I've done it. I don't want to feel the pain of others. I don't want to feel sorry about it. I don't, so, but it's always in operation. And that's God saying... Okay, but laws of love govern this universe, so you can use your will any way you want, but there's a consequence because you're breaking a law of love. When we're repentant, we say, I want to feel this pain. I want to feel the pain that I've caused Luli. I want to see the error that was in me that caused me to do it. I want to do everything I can to take away that pain from her. So then I'm using my will in harmony with love. So that's how it interacts. It's just the willingness now, when I'm repentant, to, because I want to feel that pain, then a whole other law comes into play. 
And what I understand is that God can assist us so much more when we use our will in harmony with love. So that process, we will still desire, that's the thing, we won't desire relief. We will desire Luli's pain. We will say, no, I want the pain. I want the pain now. And God will help us then to work through that pain. But when we, when we are using our will in the opposite direction, going nothing to do with Luli, I didn't do anything, I don't really want to look at that, then the law of compensation is acting upon our soul. Does that make sense? Yep. How does God work? Hang on, Jen, just wait for the microphone. When you've reached, when you've reached that point and you've longed and... How then does the higher law, how then does God work? Well, Obviously, because I don't know, it's obvious I've not engaged fully the repentance process. Yep, and it's a process I'm just engaging as well. So I used to think, oh, then God comes down and just takes away the pain from you. I don't feel that anymore. (laughs) I feel that God actually says... This is wonderful. My daughter wants to grow in love and I will do loving things to assist her to fully in, like, work through this process, those five steps that I talked about. God will assist me in that way. God will um, bring me opportunities to see what I've done. God will, God's already bringing that to me through the law of attraction, but God will really help me to become aware of those things. And God will... Um, yeah, God will lovingly guide me through that process. Whereas through the law of compensation, I'm using my will in an opposite direction. So God's going, I can't do anything else. You're going to have the pain. It's the way your soul's, I created your soul. The pain's coming to you. So basically, the law of compensation shows you that you're in a stagnant place, that you've used your will against the laws of love. That you continue to use your will against the laws okay. of love. Yeah. Okay, I understand. Yeah. And so to re- be re- released from that is the long and not try and get relief. That's what you're saying to me. Yeah, well, actually the quickest way we'll come to relief, if you like, is to engage that process, is to say, okay, I want this pain and I want it to exit me. And if we engage that process, then it doesn't have to happen over hundreds of years. We can fully launch into that grieving process and we actually end up having relief much sooner. But it's after we've gone through that painful process. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I want to ask, and I'm glad he's got his hand up, because I don't feel like I'm fully understanding how repentance works since I'm... Yeah, so God has already forgiven us for any action that we've already taken, whether we're repentant for it or not. But the feeling of God's forgiveness cannot enter us and that's while the thing I wanted we to are say. in resistance. Yeah. And so when, when we open our heart to what we've done, we allow the feeling of God's forgiveness to enter our heart and then give us peace. If we, if we do not allow... Uh, these feelings of what we've done, of repentance of what we've done to enter us, then we are in complete resistance to the forgiveness that God's already feeling for us that we are not yet feeling for ourselves uh, or feeling that God feels for us. And and it's the feeling of forgiveness that comes from God that gives us the sense of peace that it's all over now. And, And once we enter that state, we've already also dealt with the causal reason why we did the particular thing we did. Yeah. And and that's, yeah, that's what I was going to say. It opens us. When we use our will in harmony with love, God can always reach us more easily. And in my experience, feeling God's feelings for me, uh, the love and forgiveness God already has for me in that place, sometimes it triggers further repentance. It triggers further the grief. It triggers further the... Um, acknowledgement inside of me of the error that I've been in but it's in the presence of love and and that's really beautiful yeah yeah thanks babe um Jason had his hand up yeah and then if we go to Kate um I've just had one or two experiences where I felt compelled to go back to a person and 
be accountable and take responsibility as, as much as I could in that condition. Yeah. And it was such a relief and it was like soul food. Yeah. And even if the person had backlog, you know, I, I was able to fully receive it yeah. um, without resistance or even fear. Yeah. So I felt sort of like at peace receiving the, the backlog and, and the pain. Yeah. Yeah. And I just feel that it's a, such a humbling experience and um, what I was just feeling before, it's such an integral part to restore the integrity of my soul as yep. it was created in the totally. first place. I totally agree with you. That's beautiful, Jason. And the, the willingness to receive whatever comes back at you is a sign of some sincere repentance. It's a feeling that, okay, no matter how this person reacts, I still, this is still what I need to say to you. Yeah. And I agree. It's, it, as we grow, you know, we talk a lot about our emotional injury and releasing our emotional injury and all of these things. But we're going to grow in integrity as we grow in love. And that's going to lead us into things. And it's going to lead us into more emotions and into more love. But there, there is a need to grow our integrity. And, and I agree. It is, repentance is part of restoring what God created. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Kate, had your hand up. Do you still? Yeah. I've got a question about the, um, uh, yeah, the, Law of compensation and repentance and yep. law of grace. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's probably going to sound a bit intellectual because I haven't engaged the process. Sure. But um, where I just got a bit confused with it was because we won't... I'm just probably going to not be able to say this probably, but... It's okay. Um, it's because... We won't be truly, I can understand that we won't be truly repentant until we're in a condition where we could never do that again, which means yep. that we've actually released the causal reason inside us that causes us to have that lack of love. Desire or take that action, yep. Yeah. It's usually something we're avoiding inside of ourselves that causes us to take the action. So I don't want to feel my pain, so I'm going to punish somebody else. Yeah. Or I'm going to take it out on someone else, or I'm going to avoid this, or, yeah. Sorry, keep going. Um, so, yeah, but then um, where the law of grace comes into effect, that's where we are fully willing to feel what we've done to the other person. And then it's the, when we're fully willing to feel the effects of what we've done is when God can then um, come into reach into our soul and take from us the causal reason about why we did that. I feel that actually, and AJ may need to add or correct to this, but what I feel is that when we're fully willing to do those five steps that I outlined in repentance, then we can, as AJ just said, we have a connection with God and we feel God's grace, which is all, it's already in existence. God's grace is there for us all of the time. It means we're loved no matter what we do. Um, before we do something, after we do something, you know, we're always loved. We're always forgiven. Um, but when we open our soul to repentance, we want to feel the harm that I've caused you um, and the causal reason why I did it. So in that moment, I'm humble to those feelings anyway. And because I'm in a state of truth about the state of my soul and the error that it's in, God, the Holy Spirit connects through truth. Um, I receive God's love, at the feeling of grace or forgiveness that's already there for me. And in that way, I'm... I'm completing repentance, I suppose. But I don't know, I don't, I don't understand this thing about God reaching in and taking it out because yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't actually think that happens. Babe, okay. does that happen? But that's how it's been sort of explained, but my understanding of it. I think what AJ said, though, is just now, it feels like it's being taken out of us because we receive the feeling of grace. We receive the feeling of forgiveness. So... In a sense, we get what Jen was saying, relief, because we're willing to be so humble. We, we launch, like we dive into the swimming pool of pain, and 
because we're so willing to be so humble, God can connect to us and we're experiencing the emotions and we're receiving grace and it feels like it's been lifted out of us or it feels like a relief or a completion. Um, so that's my understanding of the way the laws interact. When we're in the law of compensation, we're going, I'm going nowhere near that swimming pool and God's going, okay, well... I'm going to have to keep reminding you and it's going to be with you for a while. When we turn it around and go, okay, I want to repent, then we, we want truth, we want pain, you know, whatever, whatever it is inside of us, we want it and God connect, can connect to us and then we feel this sense that it's being taken out of us. It's the quicker route, it's the narrow path that leads to God and it, it takes us there quickly. Yeah, yeah. No worries. Babe, is, is that, did I do that justice or...? <laughs> Just because you... Yes, definitely. But can I just uh, say something for the group? Yeah. The reason why many of you are asking a lot of questions about it still is because many of you still don't want to enter the actual painful process. And so you're wanting... It's our fear of the painful process that causes us to not engage a process. So, so if, if we look at it from the perspective of do we want to be repentant... The, judging by the amount of questions that we're asking about the process, there's an indication there that yeah. we are still very resistive to the process of repentance. Once we stop asking questions and just engage those five steps that you indicated, you will actually feel the feeling of God through, through this forgiveness. Because you're now open to the forgiveness that comes from God, you're open to the feeling. It's a feeling of forgiveness coming from God. Now, once you engage the process emotionally, you become open to the feeling of forgiveness coming from God and then, it, then you'll understand what it feels like once you engage the process. But, and then you don't need anybody to tell you what it feels like because you've actually felt it yourself and sometimes it does feel like what I've described, like somebody's pulling it out of you and sometimes it feels like this peaceful, serene place that you go to. But it, it feels different under different circumstances but... But you'll feel it for the first time when you engage the process fully. Mm. It's only, uh, we only want to question so much because we don't want to engage the process fully. And we've really got to look at, instead of looking at what forgiveness is, I feel we also need to look at why we're so unwilling to engage it. Yeah. And one of the primary reasons why we're so unwilling to engage forgiveness is because we are worried about what the people... Uh, 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 sorry, repentance, repentance yeah. is because we are worried about what the people, you know, the people we demonstrate our repentance to will do with it. We're, we're so afraid that they'll then take up this rageful place and, you know, punish us for what we've done in the past and we've, got all, we've all got all these hang-ups about it. So all this fear about becoming repentant. And this is one main reason why most people on the planet don't want to feel repentance, because they have so much fear about being humiliated, being controlled, being manipulated, and all these other things by being repentant, that they don't want to engage repentance at all. And that is our main problem. Our main problem is we need to deal with the barriers we have towards repentance. Then we'll easily enter repentance. And once we easily enter repentance, we'll understand it completely. Yeah. Yeah, and can I say from my own experience, you know, um, I've had a lot of those feelings about how will I be treated if I own up to what's really inside of me. And um, a lot of people um, view me as very weak and manipulated for finally doing that. Um, they feel that somehow it shows that I... Uh, I live in a state of beating myself up all the time or that I somehow I'm under AJ's control or, you know, these things get back to me <laughs> or people direct them towards me. Um, but can I say that engaging a sincere process of repentance, I feel far more sure of myself than I have ever. <laughs> I feel far less um, able to be controlled by anyone <laughs> because I really want myself and my emotions and there's been a lot of shame and a lot of feelings about being humiliated um, that I'm still working through and they are blocking me to different aspects of my repentance. But um, 
I guess I just wanted to share that because so many of us have this fear that if I bear myself, if I'm really real with the people around me, that's it. It means I'm manipulated. It means, you know, that I'm going to be punished or someone's going to be angry at me. When actually, as Jason shared earlier, when you really do it with a sincere heart, you go, do you know what, I don't care because I can tell my soul this is right in my soul and this I need to feel this if I want to be more loving and and I want to have more integrity in myself as a person and I you know so it has its its own rewards and also can I say that in those times as Barbara shared earlier when you are met with grace from the people around you um, just as I've been met with grace from my soulmate, but, you know, from many of you as well, that is a truly humbling experience as well, just as it is when we receive it from God. So um, we, we prevent the possibility of grace from those around us when we, when we don't want to just be ourselves. So, yeah, Jason. Yeah. And then we, we need to finish, so. I just um, wanted to add that when I got to a state where I knew that on a soul level that I needed to take responsibility for it, um, a couple of times uh, I've had the fears of what's going to happen to me when I, yeah. you know, uh, see this person and, and take responsibility. I've had real strong fears. And, and the only thing that got me through that was to experience beforehand my fear of the worst case scenario. So yeah. my mind will give me my own worst case scenario, my darkest fears of what's going to happen. Yeah. So um, the only way I got th through to the actual process of acting in it was to emotionally live through that fear and experience the worst case scenario. Then that I could finally go and then see the person. Yep, yeah. yep, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, awesome. Benu's just having a little meltdown out there. <laughs> Well, we must be feeling a bit triggered. Okay, guys, um, that's all we have time for. But I feel like um, that's just like a little bit of chapter three. So here's my question to you. Next week, we actually meet on Tuesday, which is only four or five days away. Do you want to try and do the end of three and four? Um, or do you want to just focus on three? I feel there's a whole lot more in Chapter 3 that there I hadn't lot. even, like, felt about. And I feel like I'd really like to do that, Talk really about delve more three. into that than okay. try to do both yep. myself. Sure. Is everyone happy with that? Yep. And um, I think that I, um, I thought of a new question <laughs> to add to the list. <laughs> And that was, I, I was just at the top of my head, I think I put it on the, I, I changed my blog a bit last week so that there is just a static page that you can go to every week and see if there's been any changes in time or place or whatever. And underneath it, it's got the questions. And I think the question is, how have I acted in faith or challenged the error within, uh, how have I acted in faith with regards to the truths in this or previous chapters? So for many of us, we see, okay, this is God's truth. How does it impact on my life? But they then say, oh, but I'm still in error around this. How are you challenging the error in your life, living in faith in regards to these truths? Do you understand the question, everyone? Yep. Um, That's beautiful. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure and um, beautiful. Thanks for sharing of yourselves. So honestly, yeah. I'll see you next week. Um, there's a couple of logistic things about next week. I don't know if we need it on the tape. So oh, we'll just do it now and then we'll say bye. Next week, it would be great if we could meet at one. That would help me. Is that going to be okay for everyone here? So we'd go one to three rather than three to five. Joy, is that a possibility out the diggers? Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, if that's all right, in principle with everyone, we'll work on that and I'll update the blog to confirm. If you see it's still at three, um, you're not going to see it's still at three. It's going to be one. Yeah, one or one thirty. So, yeah, thank you. Thanks. All right. Okay, thanks everyone. I'm so glad you're enjoying the book. Yeah, yeah. See you next week. <laughs>